didn't look like on my first run this morning. <laughs> Kidding. I don't have a slide, Joe. I don't have a video, uh, although there is some video in this in this um, in this presentation. I wanted to, particularly for our Canadian friends, to just start with a, a brief synopsis of, of who we are as PSIA in our system. You know, we were one of the first countries years ago to talk about being student-centered. Right? And, and I think Rob Sogard had a pretty good point going into our last uh, interski. He said every country now considers themselves to be student-centered in some way. Even the ones that say do it this way because that's, that's why I tell you to do it. And I'm student-centered because I'm telling you to do the right thing, right? right? There's differences in how we view student-centered. As we went into interskiing in Argentina, we really had to take a strong look at what student-centered meant. Right? When you look at, at us on the outside as instructors or examiners or national team members, the student here in the middle, they bring a lot of stuff to the table. Right? They bring fears, they bring their own development, physical, cognitive, affective, right? They bring all sorts of stuff to the table that we need to be knowledgeable in. Our organization is now 55 years old, Dave. There. Yeah, 56. Quick math, I showed off my cap skills. That's good. Right? In 55 years, we've put together a, I'm going to swear here, a shit ton of information. That's a metric term for the Canadians. A shit ton. A lot of information. So write that down. Right? Take notes on that. We have put together a ton of information to help us deal with that student. Right? There's a lot of stuff out there. If you're a ski instructor, particularly if you're going to an exam, we've got a lot of stuff that you need to be just watching work. Take a couple of these things. Biomechanics. That's a pretty big one. Let's see here. Class handling. The cat model. Teaching style. Movement assessment. Physics. Those things are university levels of study. People dedicate their lives to mastering those things. Experiential learning is in there, right up there in the top right hand corner. Experiential learning, David Cole has dedicated his life to experiential, the experiential learning cycle, dedicated his life to it. Yet we expect our instructors to know all about this so that we can make this, that little yellow spark, we can make that spark of connection with our guests, because that's the real we right? We're not after just that. Yeah, I really connection. We're after really connecting with our guests because that's what sells more lessons, that's what sells more condos, more season passes, more equipment. We're an industry partner. But you see how that's all jumbled out there? Don't you think that a lot of our instructors have that in their brain? Right? There's just so much crap. Think of a new ski instructor and all the stuff that we teach them. A lot of junk there, right? So we said, you know what, we need to take a step back. We need to take a step back, and that's where the learning connection model came in. That's what, what we took to InterSki this year, the learning connection model. And for a second, just ignore these funnels on the outside. To be a really good ski instructor, what do you need to do? What's important? That's what we asked ourselves. To really to be a good ski instructor, or a snowboard instructor, or an adaptive instructor, a cross-country instructor, you need to be good in three areas. You need to have good, strong technical skills. And when I say technical skills, what jumps into your head? You can answer skiing. Ski you need to be a good skier, right? And, I'm sorry? You need to have a good image. The reason you need to have that is if I'm going to make a connection, can you imagine if you came to this event and Jeff and I went out there and we're kind of noodling down and following apart and skis falling off and tearing ACLs, right? Can you imagine if that <laughs> Can you imagine if, if we weren't decent skiers. That would be a problem, right? You would lose your faith in our ability. So you need to be a good skier, but it goes beyond that. You need to know what the heck you're talking about. Make sense? All right. Well, you need to have good people skills. Jess got pretty darn good people skills, doesn't you? Yeah. Right? You need, we need to be able to connect with a broad range of people. Agreed? Yeah. Does anybody have an instructor in their locker room who is a tremendous skier, knows a ton about teaching, but doesn't get any private lessons, requests private lessons. Do you have that person in your locker room? Yeah, yeah. What do you suppose that person is missing? Right? They're missing this people skills triangle. I know that's small to read for the guys in the back, the folks in the back. 
But we need to be able to connect with a broad range of people so that we can make a lot of people happy and engage them on a one-on-one -on -one personal basis. And lastly, you need to be a good teacher. You need to have good teaching skills. And there's a difference between teaching skills and people skills. Great teachers usually have great people skills, agree? Great ski teachers usually have great technical skills, people skills, and teaching skills. But we, for years, so after St. Anton, spent some time talking about our technical message. Because after we went into St. Anton, this was the last inner ski, talking about how uh, diversity, right? When, when in America, people show up to our lessons on a broad range of equipment with a broad range of uh, motivations. Whether they want to be a big mountain, type of car, car, race, just keep up with the family. You see where I'm going with this. Uh, and just a, a quick story. When we were in St. Anton, I had a pair of, they were like 115 foot, because we went with these big skis, right? It, it, underfoot, no shade, fully rocked skis. And um, my, the country that I followed as a team member was Germany. Really cool country. It's a guy named Marcus, who I, I got to know him quite well. And now, uh, I, it was my day to go out with the Germans, but I wasn't sure if I was going to have to teach because we did our presentation on the same day as the Germans. So I had my stuff on, ready to do our diversity presentation, and then got cut loose, so I got to go catch up with the Germans. I catch up with Marcus, and he's talking about the perfect turn, right? Perfect skiing, <laughs> right? And perfect skiing to the Germans is carving. Right? They carve, and it's not, and, and so yeah, I'm kind of standing in the back. I had a few beers with Marcus earlier in the week, I know him. I think there was some, some uh, delegation, just general members there, and he's teaching people, and I'm just slipping around listening to what he has to say. And Marcus comes up to me in, in the middle of his clinic, he goes, hey, Matt, um, I must, I must uh, tell you, you don't want to carve it. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, okay, thanks, Marcus. And I'm figuring that was kind of like the obligatory movement analysis piece, you know, like, hey, I gotta tell him something, right? So, so I kept slipping around, and he comes up to me the next one and goes, Matt, you are not carving. I'm like, okay, Marcus, I am gonna carve, but I'm gonna need a lot of room. <laughs> like, I need a heat shield just to get the atmosphere so fast. Right? So I come flying down and I come skidding into the group. I'm like, oh, but I'm, I'm, the hair on the back of my neck was standing up. I'm all my heart's pumping. I'm like, Marcus, what do you do when people show up to your lessons with skis like these? He goes, it's simple. We send them in to get the right skis. <laughs> <laughs> and they would. And they would. Austrians too. Yeah, 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 right. So this. In America and in Canada, we can't do that, right? Our, our skiing public won't put up with that, so we need to be able to teach a broad range of methods, right? The learning connection model helps us, back to this, helps us as trainers handpick what people need. You know great children ski instructors? They're just naturally gifted as children's instructors, right? Sharing with them all the stuff that we talk about, the cat model as an example, may not help that individual. The CAP model is designed to help us be a little bit more intuitive with children. You know, if you're working with a six-year-old, it kind of makes sense to not give them five sets of directions at one, half, one after another. Hey, get your jacket, go get your skis, I'll meet you, hit the bathroom, and I'll see you outside, right? They heard, I'll see you outside. It's the last thing they heard. It just makes sense, and that's what the CAP model is designed to do. But that great children's instructor, they connect with that kid already. They get that. They already get that, so it helps us as trainers kind of handpick through this funnel what might help that person improve, as opposed to just sharing it all with them. If you think about your new higher training at your ski areas, in particular for the Children's Center, we hand that and shovel feed them a lot of stuff. We are shoveling coal into the furnace on the train as if we're trying to make it up a hill. It's a lot of stuff, and we, we as trainers can do a better job using this just to simplify. What are we really trying to do out here? We're trying to get great skiers, great teachers, and great people. Agree? That's what we took to inner ski. Can, can I talk a little bit about our, our technical message? Um, our technical message, skills concept. This, there's only so many things you can do with the ski. You can tip it, you can turn it, you can pressure the front, you can pressure the back, and you can manage a bump that puts you in the bottom. That's all you can really do with the ski. Agreed? 
If you want to jump, you've got to manage pressure. You've got to push off the earth. If you want to turn, you've got to be able to turn the ski. If you want to tip the ski, you've got to be able to tip the ski over. That's the skills concept. We've got rotary control. That's this. That's controlling the ski's rotation. Right? We've got pressure control, which could be pressuring the front of the ski or along the length of the ski. Right? It could be managing pressure from the snow. And we have edge control, which is tipping the ski. But that doesn't say a whole lot, does it? Right? That's pretty basic. That's where things change a little bit. We also have fundamental movements. We've got five fundamental movements in here. The skills concept, yeah, I mean, we saw people all day long skiing at various abilities, various technical abilities, that were doing those things to their skis, right? We saw in the video, we saw Jeff skiing in the video, pretty darn good at doing those things to his skis. And we saw some of us that were not quite as good as Jeff doing that stuff to our skis. That's where the fundamental movements come in. To do these things to the skis, as an example, to do this, we need to be able to control the relationship of our center of mass to our base of support so that we can send pressure along the length of the ski. Think about a GS turn as an example. In the bottom of a GS turn, there is a lot of stuff working to bend your ski. You've got gravity, you've got inertia, you've got all that stuff working to bend your ski. At the top of the arc in a GS turn, those things are working against you, right? Gravity's pulling you away from the ski. Right? Inertia is not, is you're moving that way, right? The ski's feeding away from you. But that's where we need to be able to send pressure to the front of the ski so we can bend the darn thing. Agreed? Right? We need to be able to control pressure from ski to ski and direct pressure to the outside ski. If I drew an S for you, when does the ski become the outside ski in that shape? Stop me. Right? A dollar sign. Right? That we need to be able to direct pressure to the outside ski. Do you know people that are way late in that? Right? We're way late. Sometimes we dive inside and we use that inside ski like a kickstand. Right? On a bike that's not moving. We tip over too far beyond what the forces. I'm kind of scared that there's video going right now, but if I say the word centrifugal force. We're not getting you know, right? right? You hear the word centrifugal force, can we all at least nod our heads so you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Right? Sometimes we move inside beyond what that force, it's an imaginary force, it's something that we feel, beyond what that force will support. We see kids do it all the time, they get dumped inside. Beyond what that force will support, and they don't stand against their outside ski. We need to be able to control edge angles with a combination of inclination and angulation. We all stand up for it. Do you know the difference between inclination and angulation? Yes. It's walk, yeah, walk to incline for me. He's inclining, right? The whole body. Right? Can you angulate for me? Right? Legs are tipped out, oh, okay, all right. So I can see people moving in the back. I can tell that some folks back there know what they're talking about. Angulating happens when you create angles in the body. Now this is what I want you to do. I want you to stand, kind of awkwardly on your right foot. You got it? Okay? And I want you to tip to the left. And when you fall off of that right foot and end up standing on your left foot? Centers. Right? Yeah, it happens pretty quick. We can, and you can, if you've got something to lean against, you can, if you've got that pillar right there, we can incline to a point that, so we can stand against the outside ski, which, ah, that's the, that's the fundamental before. But once I get tipped over a certain amount, I need to start angulating so I can continue to stand against the outside ski. So these fundamentals mesh very hard. You can, you can the, the fundamentals very much mesh. <laughs> about over the past few days with, in my group. We need to be able to control the ski's rotation with leg rotation separate from the upper body. We talked about that, didn't we? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 a lot. Once or twice. Yeah, or 15 times. We, is, and, and this is, I'm getting on my soapbox again. Yeah. Right. We, this, us, we are okay at turning the legs. We're just not okay at turning the legs separate from the upper body. I can turn my legs. My legs are turning, right? Is it turning separate from my upper body? And that's, that's my soapbox right there. We get really stuck in just not being disciplined here, right? 
this is turning my legs separate from my upper body. That's separate. We, we can use a lot more than that that's fundamental. That's why I spent my time with this group after watching the ski for a few rounds, both groups, uh, on that one fundamental. Finally, we need to be able to control the overall magnitude of pressure from the ski snow interaction. A bump, right? You get a lot of, a big magnitude of pressure. That's a big word. Jonathan Blue came up with that one. He likes words. Right? Boom, a lot of magnitude of pressure. But also at the end of the turn, sometimes we get so much pressure build up and then boom, they snap out from underneath you. And every once in a while, do you ever see that guy and you're like, oh, oh. And you're afraid that at some point in time, the leg is going to detach at the knee and stay, the bottom of the leg is going to stay in the boot and continue down the hill without the, the upper part of the leg because they hold up for so long and then this, like a slingshot, snap, they get fired out. We need to be able to control that. That's our technical message. We've got five fundamentals of skiing. Those things are the best ways to control your skis this way, this way, this way, and this way. That's what we believe. One nice thing about these fundamentals is, to me, it made things like movement assessment easier. I could look and say, I got five things. You got five things you can screw up, right? As opposed to that litany of junk that we used to talk about. For me, it just really simplified my movement assessment. Five things. Not bad. Not bad. Bob, can you go back to that slide for a second? Yep. Maybe. This is Q and A. Did you get it? Is that too personal? All right. That's our technical message. Since the end of time, the United States has shifted their their focus, not shifted their the priority. Right? We need good technical skills. We said that in the learning connection model. But we've realized that as a nation, we could be better at teaching. And I just want to show you a real quick video. Watch this video and, and see if, if some of this stuff sounds familiar. Ask, don't tell. Simple as it sounds, that's the message. To illustrate it, John is going to allow one accomplished golfer in the group to take a volunteer and tell them how to hit the ball, while John himself attempts to get another novice swinging effectively by doing nothing more than asking questions. So, take a swing at a couple of them. Now, first of all, your feet should be roughly shoulders apart. Okay? So just stand like that. Uh, yes, but that, that foot actually... Uh, just imagine yourself trying to cope with all the instructions Lindsay is about to receive. You've got to grip the club. I'll hold your hands open like that. Okay? And put your fingers over the top so the thumbs are in line with the arms. You get your arms straight. Now, move your head down the cover. And the small finger at the back, can you just lock it over like that? Okay, now, what, I don't want to, now that finger's supposed to be in line with your arms. So, put that over the back. Like that. Like that. Just come over that side. So, in line. Okay? Now, what I'd like you to do is, Meanwhile, okay. instead of telling Mandy, so, John coaches her by just asking her questions. Find out what you notice when you're swinging at the ball. Where are you paying attention? What you're looking at? What you're feeling? Anything that you notice when you go ahead and do this? Yeah. Okay. That's kind of how I go. Okay. So you, you, you're concentrating on seeing the ball. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Weigh up for yourself the advantages and disadvantages of these contrasting coaching techniques. The two key things John's trying to achieve with his questions are raising awareness and generating responsibility. Just tell me what part of your body feels more awkward than the rest. You might, you might want to divide yourself in two and start off by saying, well, arms and shoulders. Let's see how that feels this time. Then next time we'll check out the lower legs. Okay. 
right? We learn by doing. And then we gain understanding about, particularly about a motor skill, from doing it. We gain our understanding. Did you gain an understanding about skiing, and, uh, skiing today and yesterday? Thank you. <laughs> I expect more of that, by the way. <laughs> you gain understanding by doing the sport. We gain understanding. But we also know that if we can cater, as instructors, if we can cater the experience, we can accelerate that process. Right? If I can help you understand through doing, but through doing in a very targeted way. Here's another quick video. We talked about a bicycle. Just, hey, let's take the pedals off. Just so you can get used to gliding 
sitting on a bike and gliding, and then getting longer and longer strides. And I love the one pedal thing, right? Because that's one part of riding a bike that's hard. Once they came out with the pedals, my daughter wanted to put both feet on the pedals, because that's what she did when I taught her how to do it. Right? And what happens? And that's when the bike throwing happens, by the way. <laughs> they fall over, the bike throwing happens. But that's an example of how a catered experience. Was there a lot of, of technical mumbo jumbo? Was there a lot of talk from that? No, no. Very simple catering an experience so that they can feel what it's like to do it, to succeed. Pretty cool, I thought. So let's talk about teaching skiing. Oh, sorry. Here we go. There are some best practices, right? We can create situations where students can become aware. Did you become aware of your skiing over the last two days? Of specifics in your skiing? Talk to me about that real quick. What did you become aware of? Outside skiing. Outside skiing. That's an important one. Yeah. Upper and lower body separation. Upper and lower body separation. See, this is where we, as instructors, need to be tighter. Because there's a lot involved with that. Right? What about this? What did you become aware of? This? That's what I did, so I'm going to focus on that. Right? What? Uh, Say no more. We all did it. We all did it. Inside top, downhill boot. Right? That's little stuff that you can become aware of. Do me a favor, sitting in a chair right now, if you just sit and kind of sit on the end of your chair. Right? I want you to take your feet and I want you to turn to the right. Okay? Any muscular tension going on right now? Okay? Turn two more inches to the right. Two more, no, three more inches. Is there some muscular tension going on right now? Okay? Now, let's come back to straight with your feet. The muscles that you use to get that extra inch can you engage those muscles as you turn them from straight to where you start? Can you engage those muscles and turn them slowly to the right? Can you feel them engaged? It's a different way to turn your feet, isn't it? Different way to gain a sensation. That's important for us to be aware of the fine tuned stuff. We're going to get to why that's important in just a second. Very good point. Thanks. Good point. Thank you. Right? We need to help students learn from what they feel. Notice the word kinesthetics beside that. Right? Skiing is, folks, a sport. And over the past couple of decades in the United States, we've started to treat it more like a science. Right? Agreed? The guy teaching golf was treating it more like he was teaching a uh, history subject or a science subject as opposed to teaching a sport. Right? Agreed? Just please. <laughs> Finally, we need to allow the students to be a part of the learning environment. Right? If we, the guy, you know, oh, the fingers need to be here. Oh, it's got a little line up here. Your feet should right there. That guy is just doing what he told him to do. As opposed to the, the, the lady and the questioning technique, she was involved in that process. She was involved in becoming aware. That was one thing I liked from what the guy in orange did. One thing I do agree with wholeheartedly is that he helped her become aware of what she was doing and how she improved. Hopefully you all became a little bit more aware out there over the last couple days skiing with Jeff and I. This is important. Teach less with information and more with movement. Information is information. That's how you teach history. We're not teaching history, we're teaching the sport. Those are some best practices for us. How many of you are on Facebook? Ever see this meme? If a child can't learn the way we teach, maybe we should teach the way they learn. And when you see Michael J. Fox, you read that, you feel pretty good, don't you? It gives you a warm feeling in your heart. Um, we, we, to do what we're talking about, these best practices, we need to take a little bit of a look at our learning styles. When I was in college, learning about learning styles, when I say learning styles, what does that make you say as a teacher? What do you do with learning styles? Boom. We adapt to their learning style. 
right? That's how we have learned to learn about learning styles. It's how we approach learning styles. We approach a learning style where if you don't learn the way I'm teaching, I'm going to change the way I'm teaching to meet your needs. That's what Michael Fox, J. Fox just said. Can I just jump back to that slide real quick, though? There's a couple words in here that are important. If, maybe. If a child can't learn the way we teach, because maybe they can, maybe, maybe we should teach the way they learn. But, let's go back to this next slide. I want to talk a little bit about the U.S. Ski Team. The U.S. Ski Team has been involved with our national team and some of our, our divisional examiners in doing their level three. level three underneath their belt, coaches and athletes. Um, when, when, when I was at a US, uh, USSA clinicians training, and Sasha Rierick, who is the US men's ski team head coach, gave a presentation, and somebody in the back of the room said, Sasha, could you talk to me about the learning styles of the US ski team athletes? What do you think he said? I'll tell you. He said, there's a small handful of visual, I was impressed that Sasha knew this. The answer, right? There's a handful of visual learners, but far and away, most of them are doers and feelers, kinesthetic learners. So here we are, we're talking about the highest level of our sport are largely kinesthetic learners. Well, I've been doing this type of teaching for about two years now, and guess what I found with us? No. Far from it, right? If I, this is one thing I did with our Eastern education staff, right? These are uh, examiners, these are um, dev team members, DCLs. I asked them, hey, what do you do to tip your ski over, right? Right? Yeah, well, I move to this side of the skis. There's so much more than that. Can you stand up again for me? Yeah, you're going to get your exercise here. Okay? Now, can you do me a favor? I just want you to tip your feet over. Okay? Just tip your feet over. You're doing things, right? We do things inside of our ski boots. Inside. I can do this, what you're doing right there. If you can't see me, I'm going to stand up. I can do this. Right? I can feel. Can you feel your big toe lift? Can you feel your little toe side of your foot lift? You can feel muscles in the lower leg, muscles in the feet. I can do this in a ski boot. Do you have railroad track turns? Do you ever know what a railroad track turn is? Right? Have you watched people do a railroad track turn? Okay, I'll give you an example. You're going to have to see. Right? What's, a, what's a qualifying characteristic from a visual track in the snow of a good railroad track turn? They're parallel. They're parallel. They are continuous. There are two thin lines in the snow. Uh, Ed staff members, raise your hand again for me. <laughs> right? I have seen thousands of times, and I know I'm going to see some heads rattle, people that will come down trying to do a railroad track turn, right? Leave two completely smeared tracks in the snow, right? And there's not, you, it's hard to define where they get turns. It's so smeared. They'll come to a stop and say, how was that? Right? So we, is that's kinesthetic awareness. If you can't tell the basic difference between a slice and a skid, right, that shows you a little bit about our kinesthetic awareness, particularly in the United States. And I think that that's come because of, I don't know, do you remember in the early days of, how many have been in this organization for more than 20 years? Do you remember in the early days when a lot, there was just a lot of tasks? You did hop turns, feast turns, you did uh, split swing hops, you just did a lot of stuff. But then somewhere along the line, our, our guests said, no, I'm not doing that, right? So then we started teaching very conceptually. Somewhere along the line, you heard the words, as if, a lot. I want you to ski as if, <clears throat> and that sentence, lay on your stomach, right? Uh, uh, rubber band attached to your waist to the, to the base lodge, as if you were in a tunnel, right? So you didn't rise up and bang it. We got very conceptual of how we taught. From that, I think this had a lot to do with some of the online forums, like Epic Ski that's out there. We got more technical, right? We got more information based, and we started talking about. Does anybody know where the uh, the the peroneus tertius muscle is? <laughs> There's a lot. It's in your leg. It's in your leg. 
right? And so you're like, there are a lot of instructors that know a lot about muscles, bones, joints. I don't need to know that. I just need to know, hey, there's muscles in the front of my leg, and I've got to flex them, right? When you turn your feet, and with using, those are the muscles that you are using. I don't need to tell my student what the muscle is, unless they really want to know. And even then, I'm going to have to Google it. But we've got very information-based, and that, that, that speaks to me a little bit. The highest level of skiing in the world, head legging, is not necessarily, he's a kinesthetic learner, but a lot of us aren't. There's a lot of us that are waiting for the answer, right? Versus, where's that, uh, Jamie? Jamie, all day long, said, man, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm working, this is what I'm doing, I'm trying this, can you look and tell me if I'm anywhere near close? She's finding answers. We need more of that. That's kinesthetic awareness. That's beautiful. Love you, girl. Love okay. Um, through that level three exam, by the way, let's talk a little bit about learning styles. The U.S. ski team, they go out there, it was Eric Lipton, Robin Barnes, Michael Rogan, and Dave Lyons. Lipton, like, he tells the story so much. I said, yeah, I'm like, listen, you need to do this, right? This, not this. And I can't remember who the skier was. I'm like, yeah, what, do, what, what about the skis? What are the skis like? Eric's like, look, do this, not this. But what about the skis? What are the skis doing? Do this. Like he was speaking a different language where you just speak slower and louder, right? To get him to understand. Right? Do this, not this. But they were so hung up on the kinesthetics that they had trouble doing that. But throughout the week-long process, they started thinking about skiing and learning about skiing in a different way. Has anybody noticed what's been going on with the U.S. ski team as of late? Anybody ever heard of a guy named Steven Nyman? Right? We are seeing a market rise from some of those guys, not the, the Teds and the Bodies, right? But from some of the folks behind them, you're seeing podiums and podiums and podiums to the point that Stephen Nine is talking about he wants to win the overall World Cup. He wants to be in the US and the American downhill. Right? That they accredit some of that to learning about skiing in a different way. We as instructors need to help our guests our members of these organizations think about skiing and learn about skiing in a different way. That's why today, from my group, right, yesterday from my group, we based it largely in sensations, largely in what you feel, little targets, little movement cues that you feel. So what's this mean? At the highest level, you've already started learning. Learning to learn in different ways. They achieve results because of it. For us, for us, this is what this means for us. We're asking you to learn in different ways. Why are we asking you to learn in different ways? I don't even need the slide. Because, you know, right, if we're going to ask you to teach in a different way, we've got some work to do. We need to become more aware of ourselves, more aware of the fine-tuned little things. I shared with you the fine-tuned little things that I feel. They might not be the fine-tuned little things that you feel. I asked my group today if they knew what the word onomatopoeia. Anybody know what an onomatopoeia was not in my group today? Whoosh. Give me another example. Whoosh. Give me another one. Bang. Beep. Bang. Kapow. An onomatopoeia is a word that describes the sound, right? In writing in particular. Because I can go, you know what that sound is? How do I write that? Right? P, K, I don't know how to write that, so I use kapow or bang. There is not a word that describes sensations. these terms as if it's a little, duh, hey, turn your legs more in your upper body. Uh, okay, right, is that, is that it? No. Move forward. Well, how much forward? How do I know? And we can get a lot more specific through talking about specific sensations within our boots, within our feet, as opposed to, I want you to move your hands forward. Did I move forward when I did that? Nope. Nope, right? Are my legs turned more than my upper body? Nope, right? Do my legs turn more than my upper body? 
right? We coach a lot from up here. There's a lot of stuff that we can do down inside our boots. But before we can start teaching it, we need to become more aware. That's the end of my Uh, clarifications, questions, I know we've got dinner waiting. Uh, anything I can clarify wasn't clear enough on. What if I don't feel it? If you don't feel it, you're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> I will say this, as educators, when I, I can say this is the first time in two years that I've worked with two different groups, but I even have somebody say, I, I don't get it, I don't feel it. Get that a lot. And in years past, I would have said, oh, well, let me try it a different way. Now I said, well, yeah, let's go back and try it again, right? I want you to keep, because you need to be able, to, it's important to be able to feel to do a sport. Imagine teaching somebody, to, anybody can juggle? Can you imagine teaching somebody to juggle without balls? <laughs> right? Okay. All right, this is what you want to do. You're going to take your right hand, you're going to bounce it up in the air, right? Right? We, you need to be able to do and feel to be able to perform a sport. Any other questions or clarifications? James on, right? If you find an instructor in your staff who's talking all the time, take them out and have a clinic where they have to teach somebody something the only thing they can't use is words. And yeah. it's pretty fun. So. Pretty fun. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions, concerns, clarifications? Great Thank job. you, James.